can change the world. Shall we go to outer space to the moon? Or shall we go to inner space and have a fantastic voyage? Well, I think the real question is, why not both? We're going to find out all about that with a serial problem-solving entrepreneur, Naveen Jain. Naveen, welcome. Thank you very much for hosting me here. So that, is that what you are? Was it to call you a problem-solving entrepreneur, is that correct? Well, to me, every entrepreneur actually is a problem solver. To be an entrepreneur, you just don't have to think about a problem or come up with a solution. Entrepreneurs are the doers. So if you're not solving a problem, you're not an entrepreneur. So I think that to some extent, they're one and the same. I want to talk about some of the latest stuff that you've done, particularly a, a writing that you've done called Moonshots. And there's some great quotes in it, and so we're going to delve right into it. Uh, first, I believe the next 10 years will change the trajectory of the way humanity lives. Oh, that's a big statement. Well, there has never been a time in the human history where the technology is converging at such a fast pace. So it used to be a one technology at a time and it came every 20, 30 years and people could actually get used to it. For the first time, you're starting to see the artificial intelligence, the sensors are becoming smaller, powerful and ch uh, cheaper. And you're starting to see that whether it is a, a self-driving car, so you're starting to look at uh, you know, uh, Alexa and the voice-enabled gadgets. And you're starting to see that uh, people are starting to understand what's happening inside the human body. People are starting to see the depths of the ocean. People are starting to understand what's happening in the space. And all of those things are possible at a price point that no one could possibly imagine. And what's really exciting is for the first time, the individuals and a small group of people are capable of doing things that could only be done by the large companies or nation states. And I believe the entrepreneurs are going to be the next superpowers, solving some of the problems that could only be solved by the kings and the queens or aristocrats or for that matter the presidents and the prime ministers of the uh, large countries or superpowers. Well, you just said an awful lot there. but. Uh in, in getting to it, the, the names of the super entrepreneurs that you're talking about are Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Naveen Jain. I would say it is really Paul and David and Jones because every one of us are capable of doing it. You really don't need a lot of resources to get something going. It takes a determination and it takes a group of people who believe it is possible because the day you believe something is impossible, it becomes impossible for you. So it is really doesn't take a, you know, a large country to be mobilized to go to space. It takes a small group like us, 30 people who say we can go to the moon never having to worry about no private company has ever left Earth orbit. And here we sit here today to tell you that we are the only company in the world, despite the names you mentioned, Elon and Jeff and Richard, none of them have actually even have a permission to leave Earth orbit. And not only we have permission to leave Earth orbit, we're the only company that have permission to land on the moon. <laughs> well, we're gonna be talking about Moon sure. Express here in a few minutes, but, but before we even get there, I've gotta to go to a couple of other quotes sure, in please. there. You said this, we can be certain that half of the Fortune 500 companies will not be around in the next 15 years. Yeah. Is that a bad thing? That is actually a really good thing because what happens is it allows the new technologies and new ideas to start to form and it starts to get people to do things that has never been done before, right? So if you start to see the average age of the company in the Fortune 500 used to be 50, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Now the average age is 10 to 15 years and I believe it is going to come down even sooner. And what you're going to start to see would be that just because someone is, is doing something that's ahead of you by five years, they're actually two years closer to dying because every single technology is becoming obsolete every five to seven years. So even if someone is ahead of you, it actually is closer to dying, and that means you have an advantage over them in terms of a new set of technology, five years advantage, because they're five years ahead of you. These companies, though, are huge employers. Yes. Does that mean their jobs go away? No. no, jobs never go away. Jobs simply morph. And, you know, I know there is a lot of discussion around artificial intelligence, and as it starts to come along, it used to be the only the blue-collar jo jobs that went away. And now, for the first time, we're starting to see, would accounting be done by this uh, artificial intelligence? Could the, you know, legal work can be done by the artificial intelligence? What is the job that could not be done by the artificial intelligence? 
Yeah. You mean get rid of lawyers? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and the point is, there are very, very few things one could argue where the humans are actually going to be better than um, artificial intelligence. And I believe it's only a matter of AI would change to AI is now the artificial intelligence that done by the computer and it's only a matter of time where humans become will have an AI which will be called the ancient intelligence. How do we play a role then? Do well, we not just give it to the machines? Well it is not about us versus them. It is going to be us and them in a symbiotic relationship. Just like we're going to talk about that we as humans are really have the same thing. We are a walking, talking ecosystem. It trillions of micro mm -hmm. uh, microbes inside our gut. And it's not about us versus them. It is us and them living in harmony in a symbiotic relationship. And that's the second company we're going to talk about, yeah. Viome, here in just a yeah. few minutes yeah. too. And I'm really excited to get to, get to yeah. that as well. I got to ask you about this. Sure. It is quite possible that in the near future, you, you may never own a car because every car could potentially be available to you. Interestingly enough, just this morning I was talking with a transportation engineer who was talking about this very yeah. thing. He says it's coming sooner than you think. That's right. So it's very interesting is that as self-driving cars come about, and I think, you know, just to step back for a second, what I was saying was, in this era where the technology is moving so fast, where the, by the time the company is ready to become a public, a public company, they become mature, they may actually be obsolete. So it's quite a chance that Uber, before it goes public, Uber may actually may not have a business before it goes public. And here's why, because what they did was, they created a massive amount of driver network. And the driver network gave them an advantage to have a always available car. When you have a self-driving cars, the car manufacturer becomes the driver. In that case, a car driver, a car manufacturer has a large set of drivers that are already built in. So Tesla can become an Uber instantly overnight, or GM can become a Uber overnight. And that means the advantage is Uber has goes away. And coming back to it, what I'm saying is that the ownership of the, whether it's a home ownership or the car ownership will fundamentally change because whenever you need a car, the car will be available to you depending on whatever car you need for what need. So if you're going long distance, you can probably get a different car and if you're going out on a date, you can probably get a nice electric Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> and a much more efficient use of the vehicles and of our roadways all at the same time. Yeah. Because car ownership is very expensive, and you yes, use the is. car for less than 5% of the time, and most of the time it's sitting in the parking lot. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, we're talking with Naveen Jain, who is uh, a serial problem-solving uh, entrepreneur. He has written something called Moonshots, and we're going to link to that so that you can read it too. Um, let's talk about the entrepreneurship opportunities that are out there. Uh, and you talk about them in terms of disruptive technologies, and that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the not too distant future things that you, that you see? Well, you know, first of all, every single uh, uh, problem that you see today, it is an opportunity for an entrepreneur. In fact, the bigger the problem, bigger the opportunities. Healthcare, uh, poverty, exactly. uh, education. So the way I look at the stuff is if you want to create a billion dollar company, all you have to do is solve a $10 billion problem. What are these 10 billion, $100 billion problem? You just mentioned the healthcare, poverty, uh, abundance, creating abundance of food, creating abundance of energy, creating abundance of water, cre you know, all solving the problem of education, right? Whether you look at education or you look at healthcare, need, these systems are not broken, they're simply obsolete. And someone has to go out and make them personalized, make them uh, in, in, to some extent, uh, use them for the current need that exists, not the reason they were created for. I want to go to one of the graphics that's in Moonshots. Yeah. It's the age of tech, and you and you were talking just a few yeah. minutes ago about companies. Just 10 years ago, yeah. the, of the top six companies in terms of value, yeah. uh, there was only one tech company on there, Microsoft. Yeah. Now, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and ExxonMobil is the only one that's yeah. not a tech company. Yeah. So it's really what's happening is that Tech is no longer something that you, you know, is a tech company. Everything that you do is really becomes a tech. So you look at an automobile like a Tesla, it's really a computer on wheels, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you start to think about every single thing we do, tech is becoming part of who we are as humanity. Everything is now, we are able to go out and say, Alexa, turn off the lights, right? Mm -hmm. Alexa, go out and do this. And now people are building the Alexa enabled toilet, so you can just say, Alexa, flush the toilet. <laughs> you don't even have to yeah. do that. <laughs> so, 
So what we see on Star Trek is not science fiction anymore. Well, it's you know tricorder that we used to be really in love with as a Star Trek, and uh -huh. now we think now we have a tricorder devices that can diagnose the diseases better than any doctor can. Yeah. You said before that entrepreneurs are going to be the next superpower. So is that corporations ruling the world? Oh, oh, unlike, because see what's really happens is when you are a elected power, you can only be held responsible every election cycle. Whereas the entrepreneurs can be held responsible every single day. Every single day when you step out of line, the people can stop buying your product and you're done. Right? So mm -hmm. if you think about it, what happened to Uber, when the day the president announced that they're going to ban some of the immigrants from certain countries, they had a taxi strike and people didn't want to do that. They sent Uber to pick up the people. That day, 200,000 people deleted Uber. And the next day, uh, the CEO of Uber resigned from the president's council. When we found out that he was doing things that were uh, not quite kosher from a society's perspective, he was thrown out. So the point is, Unlike, a prime, unless, unlike our president, we, we just have to learn to live with him. The entrepreneurs, if they step our line, we can throw them out. <laughs> you know, you, you've also said, said this as well. Entrepreneurs, are, which essentially are capital providers, they're not patriotic. They go where the opportunities are. Is that a bad thing? Well, in fact, other way around, the capital flows where the opportunities are. So entrepreneurs' job is to create the opportunities and not having to worry about where the capital is going to come from because capital is not patriotic. The capital comes where the opportunities are. So if you're sitting in India and you create an amazing opportunity, people from all over the world would want to invest in that. So it doesn't really matter any longer. The geographical boundaries are no longer the boundaries that entrepreneurs have to really honor because the nation states have to honor the national boundaries. The entrepreneurs are always global. They don't care where the money is coming from. They don't care where the talent is coming from. In fact, the people who are working in companies are working all over the world. So the entrepreneurs are the guys with the ideas and the drive to be able to make the ideas happen. That's right. And just to let everybody know, uh, Naveen Jain is not just talking about this from an academic standpoint. He actually did it himself. I think you came to the United States with $5? Yes. Not bad. Not bad. You know, it's like living an American dream, I would say. <laughs> uh, speaking of dream, the X Prize. You're a big part of the X Prize. And you talk about how it is, you're looking for it to be won by non-experts because they don't know what not to try. That's right. So this very interesting thing is when we see every single time the disruption happens, not from the people who are from the industry or from who are experts. So one of the things that I always find is a lot of the people are so scared of going into industry because they say, I know nothing about it. And I think that's the biggest asset you have when you know nothing about it. In fact, I have done now seven companies and no two companies has ever been in the same industry because I believe once you become good at something, the best you can do is to improve it incrementally by 10% or 15%. But if you want to change something 10 times or 100 times, you have to challenge the foundation of everything that experts have taken it for granted. So non-experts are always the ones that end up solving a problem in a way that has never been thought or solved before. What if you fail? Well, failure only happens when you give up. Every idea that does, it does not work is simply stepping a stone to a different idea or a bigger idea. So that, uh, you know, human beings fail, entrepreneurs pivot. Let's go to the moon. Moon Express. You are the co-founder of a company that, as you said, has the rights from the United States yes. to go to the moon. But you're in competition with China because you're going there for one great big huge asset. So interesting thing is, if I'm an entrepreneur, I would rather compete with nation states all day because nation states have never actually been entrepreneurial. They're always more worried about what people may or may not want to do. They do not want to take any risk of any kind in terms of using the latest technology. In mm -hmm. fact, our country is no different. Correct. I was at NASA JPL and they're going to be launching a Mars 2020. So in, in, think about it, two years from now, they're gonna be launching a Mars mission and the processor they're using on that is Intel 286. We haven't seen Intel 286 for 20 years, right? And the only reason they keep using it is because that's what they used the first time and it worked and they don't even wanna to try to say, hey, maybe the new processor can actually be substantially better. They don't go to that. To them, it's always about keeping what's there. So if they use something, they can never change it. Entrepreneurs like us, are using the latest technologies. For example, to understand landing on the moon, we use the laser LIDAR. Those LIDAR used to cost 
one and a half, two million dollars. Now we simply buy them for $250, the same ones that people use them in the self-driving car. Cameras used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now we just GoPros, right? So the <laughs> point is really the interesting thing is all of the things that people used to spend so much money on is now suddenly being cheap because as an entrepreneur, you're able to really do the things and take a little bit of risk. Whereas in nation states, you always have to worry about what, polit what politics lo look like rather than what the business looks like. Mm -hmm. Speaking of business, why are you going to the moon? Well, if I could rephrase John F. Kennedy, it's going to sound something like this. We chose to go to the moon not because it's easy, because it's a great business. And the reason we go to the moon is because it's a great business. So, uh, for example, there is, you know, moon has 16 quadrillion worth of resources. Whether it's a helium-3, a small quantity of helium-3 could power this planet for generations to come as a clean energy fusion source resource. Mm -hmm. uh, there are you know, the obviously platinum grade material, there is rare earth elements, and the moon has water. And the water is really the ingredients of water creates rocket fuel, hydrogen, and oxygen, which is creates the human, the, you know, fuel for humans. The main thing really to go to the moon is to create a multi-planetary society. We, all of us as humans, are living on a single spacecraft. Imagine if this spacecraft got hit by a large asteroid. We're all going to become a dinosaur, right? Yep. And if you can ask any dinosaur rolling in their grave, what would they be saying? If they had one good entrepreneurial dinosaur, they'll still be roaming on the moon, Mars, and beyond. Didn't mm -hmm. quite happen for them. Let's not repeat the same mistake and all die as humanity. You know, some people who are watching are gonna say, okay, that's great, we have this multi-planetary society and we can't even clean up our own streets. Yeah. Interesting thing is that is the th that is the mindset of a scarcity. So it's not a choice of should we should we solve the problem of healthcare on Earth or go to the moon. The answer is do both. So I believe as an entrepreneur, when given an option, you take both. So I am doing both solving the problem of healthcare on Earth and creating a multi-planetary society because in case something happens that's outside our control, we still have a plan B in place. That's, that's fantastic. We're going to get to the healthcare. Uh, I, I, I got to get to yeah, another quote, yeah. though. You say disruption happens yeah. when someone who has no idea about your industry begins to challenge the foundations of everything the ex experts have taken for granted. What happens when you, Naveen Jain, challenge the experts? Do they challenge back? So interesting thing is that's how the learning happens is your job as a non-expert is not to come up with a solution but to challenge why it can't be done differently and every expert their first reaction is that will never work and then you start to ask them why that would never work and by the time you start explaining it's a matter of time they say wow gee that just might work to wow that's a brilliant idea right and that's really the day before any breakthrough is a crazy idea and the day after the breakthrough is an obvious idea so what was it with your idea with for moon express i mean you're not an astronaut yes of, and not a rocket scientist either. The whole idea was to bring the knowledge of a different industry from a software industry and say, in a software, we don't write a monolithic code in one big code. Why do we have to have a rocket that has to be one big rocket that goes all the way? Why can't we have smaller modules that can essentially do the trick? So instead of using a one big rocket that would have cost us $200 million, now we are using a rocket that only goes to low Earth orbit and only costs us $4 million. And now our spacecraft take it from there and essentially goes and lands on the moon. That cost of doing the things is under $10 million compared to the $10 billion that we spent in 1960s. Wow. There's a brilliant quote, and I'm just going to say it right, it's a brilliant quote out of Moonshots. And you say this, an organization's legacy knowledge becomes a liability, a competitive weakness that makes them an easy mark for obsolescence. As you look across the business landscape of uh, the United States, yeah. if not possibly the world, yeah. uh, are there businesses, industries in risk of obsolescence? I would say there is not a single industry that is not going to be disrupted and obsoleted. And you saw what happened to the camera industry, right? Mm -hmm. The camera yep. industry was completely de demolished, right? Same thing is starting to happen in insurance industry. Would there be a car insurance when you have self-driving cars? What will happen to the life insurance when people are not dying in the car accident? What will happen to the real estate industry when instead of when self-driving cars exist and the parking lots, don't, we don't need to have a cars parked right next to us. And all those parking lots can now become affordable housing. What would happen to the, you know, 
if you start to think about every industry I can go one by one by one, there is not a single industry that is not going to be disrupted. And the new ways of doing things will come about, right? Would the even currencies exist as you start to look at the cryptocurrencies? Would even be mm -hmm. nation states, the things that they have is having their own currency, would that even mean anything anymore? All right, well, let's, let's get personal then. Let's talk about my health because you say this in the book. At Viome, uh, which is another one of your companies in healthcare, our goal is to create a world where sickness is elective. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So it's very interesting is that all of the chronic diseases, it's not something that you catch. It is something you develop over a period of time. And when I, you know, I've been looking at this problem for the last year and a half, and every scientific research it is starting to show that all the chronic diseases happen because of chronic inflammation. And the chronic inflammation happens because your gut microbiome is in, in, not in balance. And I want to spend just you know, a little bit of time explaining what the microbiomes are. We as humans have more foreign microbial cells in our body than the human cells in all of us. Right? So we are more, more foreign microbial than actually human. When it comes to um, gene expression, our human DNA only expresses 20,000 genes, and these microbiome in our gut actually have two million genes. So we are less than 1% human, 99% microbial. And you wonder, how did we get created? We are just a walking, talking carrier for all these microorganisms. And if you have a few minutes, I can tell you. I'm my, a host. Okay, I'm theory of, actually that's exactly what it is. We are a host, and how were we created? I have a theory. I believe, as you know, the bacteria and viruses have been around on the planet Earth for four billion years. Mm -hmm. The humans came about, give or take, about 200,000 years ago. So I think here's how it happened. A million years ago, all the bacteria and viruses got together and they said, you know, we're sick and tired of living in this small area. We want to take over the world. And one wise one says, I think I have an idea. What if we create something? that's gonna carry us around. A trillions of us can be actually inside them, inside their gut. All we have to do is to keep them healthy. They're gonna run around and feed us all the time. They're gonna go everywhere, they're gonna poop everywhere, they're gonna spread us everywhere, and we're gonna take over the world. And everyone says, that's a brilliant idea, and they created humans, right? And now, suddenly, they, just like we are afraid of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. they started to get worried. What will happen if this organism that we just created becomes smarter than us? What will happen to all of us? And they went to the master. Master, master, we are worried about this. This thing becoming really intelligent, even more intelligent than ours. And master said, don't worry. Even within ourselves, we put one of our brothers, call, they call that mitochondria. The thing that supplies energy is one of our brother bacteria. And we supply energy to them. They go out of line, we're gonna shut the energy down. But master, what about the brain? Oh, I forgot to tell you, our gut is connected to the brain through the vagus nerve. All the serotonin, 90% of the serotonin, we're gonna produce ourselves. We're gonna control what they think, we're gonna control what they behave, and we're gonna have these people, these things believe they are making a decision, but we're gonna control all their decisions. And that's we are as humans, all controlled by a puppet masters in our gut. Very well, but the U.S. healthcare system, though, is not geared to that. The U.S. healthcare system seems to be geared to treating symptoms. And what I'm hearing you say uh, out of Viome yeah. is that you're kind of changing the discussion. That is fundamentally what's happening. Our healthcare system is, you know, to some extent, actually become a parasite on humanity. They're trying to keep people sick because when you have a chronic disease, they have a subscription business. You have to take the drug for the rest of your life. Interesting thing is every chronic disease, whether you name it Parkinson's or autism or Alzheimer's, or you name it depression or anxiety or obesity or diabetes or autoimmune disease or even cancer, is caused by the imbalance of microbiome. So much so that not only the cancer is caused by the microbiome, whether the cure for cancer works or does not work depends on your gut bacteria. So whether you take anti, you know, immunotherapy drug or chemotherapy drug, whether it works or completely fails depends on your gut microbiome.
So you're talking about a huge change, though. There's a, a lot of people who make an awful lot of money off of our current health care system. They won't like it that you, Naveen Jain, and others are going to be saying, you know, hey, we really need to look at the gut microbiome. And, you know, that is fundamentally how the industry is disrupted because today we have this thing called one set, you know, one set of symptoms, name them, which is called a disease, and have a drug. The same, sim, the same set of symptoms, the so same disease can be caused by hundreds of different reasons. And as opposed to solving the underlying root cause, people are now focused on solving the symptom. Very interesting that we have now, you know, 10,000 people who have actually already been using Wyom. And we find our customers telling us that they lost weight. So one of the women who just went on a Dr. Oz show says she lost 70 pounds because we didn't focus on her losing weight. That was a symptom. Her problem was her gut was inflamed. And once we fixed the inflamed gut and the leaky gut, she lost weight. Other women you know, had acne and depression. That symptom, that disappeared because we fixed her inflammation and a leaky gut. And so to us, you know, focusing on the root cause is really what allows all these symptoms to go away rather than suppressing the symptom and having, the having to take a drug for the rest of your life. So the company Viome, is that what it does? Does it balance your microbiomes? So it actually looks inside your gut to see not only what organisms are there, we look at how active they are and what they are producing. And once we know what they're producing and what's lacking, we mm. give you the right food and the right supplements that we uh, ask you to take that essentially makes the, makes the guts, uh, gut and the ecosystem balance. You make a very bold statement in Moonshots. You say once we obtain FDA approval we'll be able to diagnose every single disease because we'll know what is being expressed by every pathogen and we'll be able to see exactly what's active in the body. That's, That's right. a big statement. So this actually just so you know this technology came out of Los Alamos National Lab where they had designed it for the national security for the biodefense work. So they were trying to solve the same set of problem. If a bad actor were to get hold of something, how would we know what's making us sick? So we got the exclusive license to that technology to find out what's making people sick. And now we're using the technology to keep people healthy. So what we are saying is we are looking at all of the gene expression. We are looking at all of the mi you know, microbiome gene expression. And then we are trying to use the artificial intelligence to find out exactly what is causing what disease. And now we already have 10,000 10, people. Once we have a million people, we'll have plenty of data to know what's being caused by what, what organism and what gene expression. And we'll be able to control it and modulate it. And that's how we believe we are going to be able to create a world where chronic illness is going to be a matter of choice, not a matter of bad luck. Uh, we only have a few seconds left. Viome itself, what's next for it? How can people use it? So today, the, you can go there right now to viome.com and mm -hmm. sign up. Interesting thing is this technology used to cost $10,000. Now you can go sign up for $399, and you can do as many tests during the year as you want for $199. And not only you will get better, in fact, Every single person who joins really joins the community and the revolution that makes everyone before them and after them uh, better. Naveen, thank you very much for thank being with us. Thank you very much, Steph. What a pleasure.